कॉलेज विश्वविद्यालय मध्य भारत में ही नहीं वरन राष्ट्रीय एवं अंतर्राष्ट्रीय स्तर पर टॉक्स और लेक्चर्स का आयोजन समय समय पर करता रहा है इसी श्रृंखला में प्रबंधन विषय को जानने और विश्व स्तर व्यवहारिक ज्ञान और स्किल मैपिंग कौशल प्रबंधन और मूल्यांकन विषय पर अमेरिका की यू यूनिवर्सिटी के प्रोफेसर मैनेजमेंट स्पीकर और स्किल एनालिस्टिक मूरे जॉनसन ने सेज ग्रुप के साथ विचार साझा किए उन्होंने जीवन में कौशल की भूमिका और प्रबंधन की विशेषताओं को भारतीय संदर्भ में समझाया और मैनेजमेंट के क्षेत्र में भविष्य की संभावनाओं की जानकारी दी and then being able to systematically improve on them uh so that we can go ahead and prosper in an era where we're seeing quite a lot of uncertainty so um skill mapping is basically a technique that we use to be able to look at our ability to define what makes for skills people want and so i've chosen this kind of uh, old painting here uh, to kind of symbolize that we have this rather old gentleman uh who looks kind of uh ragged around the edges and has kind of uh, old hair white hair like me and then we have someone who's very very young uh, and clearly the audience is much more engaged with the new person than the old the thought being that as we age most likely a lot of skills that we have become obsolete in other words new no longer is relevant so we're going to have to engage in a certain type of actions um i think today is a wonderful age and i was searching for a, a really good quote to kind of be able to describe this and uh, i decided to use one from uh the european tradition from uh britain specifically an author by the name of charles dickens and he started out in the tale of two cities and he said it was the best of times it was the worst of times it was the age of wisdom it was the age of foolishness it was the epoch of belief it was the epoch of incredulity it was a season of light it was a season of darkness and it was a spring of hope and it was a winter of despair and so today what i like to do is i like to talk a little bit about hope um and i'd like to talk a little bit about the change changing right before our eyes actually uh and this is affecting all of us and all of our major industries as well in the old days uh some people think we had a system where the primary purpose of education was basically to have people be able to mm, work in factories and so but required hired us approach to be able to get everyone to be somewhat self disciplined but today we're seeing a very very uh different environment actually uh this is campus uh, on the left side uh, this is where i come from from the UCLA one and i just got this in 2 days ago and it just struck me um this is a area of the campus where there's normally many many students walking around even in the evening and you can see it's desolate it's empty and so we have this strange phenomenon where many of our universities are in effect empty uh these facilities where we spent uh millions hundreds of millions of dollars in many cases to be able to build up aren't even being used and instead we're going towards the environment on the right where we're looking at the idea of learning and uh learning online so the whole environment has shifted and in in, uh, in uh, here uh it took about a week actually for the universities to shift from live to online uh i'm not saying they're doing such a great job at it necessarily but it happened very 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 quickly and so this is what people refer to um as a uh paradigm shift so what caused it well obviously uh was causing a lot of uh, issues in our societies today is uh coronavirus and some people have described this as uh, the virus is creating a world in which is described by the uh letters b u c a which stands for volatile and certain confusing and last but not least ambiguous in other words um we live in limbo and the only certainty 
is uncertainty. For just in the last two months, uh, the rate of change has gone up drastically. This is volatility. Number two, we're not able to necessarily predict events anymore. Um, who would have predict international travel to be able to be decimated and hospitality to be decimated the way it was? Number three, there's no clear connection between cause and effect. For example, advertising and marketing, uh, it's not clear exactly what the message should be anymore. And last but not least, we have multiple meanings for what's going to be happening now and in the future. And uh, some of you in the audience may want to be economists or maybe are economists already. And so people have been describing to me, uh, our economies will be going down very, very quickly um, through this quarter and maybe even longer. And then uh, maybe it will come up very quickly. So that is, of course, the V. So they call this the V shape. Um, but other people say, no, 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 no. It's going to be a U shape. It's going to go down and then it's going to stay low for a while. And then eventually it's going to come back. Um, and then every once in a while, someone who's very pessimist might say, no, it's going to be an L shape. Um, so we might be in a, a situation where things are changing. The options that we have then basically is that we must, for us to prosper in this century, develop a set of skills, which I refer to as 21st century skills. Some of these skills will be the same as they were last century, but some of them are going to be very different. Um, they didn't exist last century. Um, the second point is uh, we need to understand that unfortunately, uh, once we graduate from our university, we can't stop learning. And some of you are already that way. Um, but I think a lot of my students actually, once they get their first degree, is a uh, stop in any meaningful way, uh, developing themselves and learning. And to me, this is, I believe, a great mistake. Um, I sometimes refer to that as entering the zombie zone. Um, in other words, they're uh, alive, kind of, but also they're kind of dead because they stop learning in a meaningful way um, and they're not learning new behaviors. And the second thing is, I believe, is we're entering an era of more personalized learning and learning that can be adapted more uh, to myself. So let me just kind of talk a little bit then about how to go about doing this. Cause I'd like to actually have everyone uh, walk away with something that they feel would be very, very helpful and very useful to them. Um, and as you can see, I tend to like to use quotes from, uh, from dead people. So it goes uh, at the very top. Um, this one is from Shakespeare. All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and they have their entrances. And one man in his life plays many parts. So as you can imagine, since I happen to be from Los Angeles, this would appeal to me since this has to be an idea of uh, playing a role on the stage. So the way I think about it is that we're all uh, going to be playing different roles as we go through life. The roles in our family, very, very, very important. And of course, the roles on the stage of work. So when we look at doing something like this, uh, we could make it really super complicated. But I think that the best way to do this would be to say we have kind of four roles that we have to kind of think a little bit about. First one's my current role. Second one is my next role. Third one is my dream role. And then last but not least, uh, my last one, the fourth one be, would be my next life role. So for those of you that are students, the, the current role you have is of course to be a student. And so the, um, you've all, I think, probably mastered that one already. I assuming everybody's getting an A, 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 or good grades, yes, yes. I see some smiles on faces, ah, uh, okay. Well, I wasn't, a, I wasn't someone who did that, by the way. I got a lot of grades that weren't A's in my academic uh, transcript. So you mastered the role of being a student, um, so on and so forth. And then you have to master the first work, work role, uh, which we call the next role. 
after that, of course, uh, we want to think a little bit about what we want to do with our life, and we'll call that the dream role. And last, uh, of course, is uh, our next life. Uh, what comes after this life, which, of course, gets into issues of uh, reincarnation. So um, the way that I kind of think about it is uh, I, I, I need to think a little bit about what I want to do with my life. And so I want to have a role, something I'm striving for. So let me just kind of walk through this, everyone, and I hope that this helps uh, in terms of thinking about your career. So the way we've done it is basically we've said, look, uh, first of all, define your current role. Um, and in business, uh, there's a saying, the best predictor of success in a future job is your current one. So the thought is that your current role predicts how you will do in the future. The next thing that uh, always uh, is an issue for many students is what do I do after I graduate? And my business students actually sometimes are not very clear. And so I will sometimes ask them, well, what are you gonna do after you get your degree? And they say, oh, well, professor, I'm not really sure, but I know I'm going, whatever I do, I'm gonna make a lot of money. So I thought, well, let's, that's okay. I mean, you know, making money is not the worst thing one should do in life, but gosh, it'd be much better if you had kind of a clear definition of what kind of job you wanted to have after you got out of school. Um, so again, this would be what we refer to as the next role for students. Finally, sometimes I will ask them what they want to do, assuming they're going to be working. And so uh, I oftentimes ask them, well, uh, how long do you think you're going to live? And of course, um, this is always kind of an interesting question. No one's really sure. Um, but the last numbers I saw is that the average person most likely could live to be well over 120 years with the advances in medical science. Um, this is causes my students to be horrified, actually, because they imagine themselves really over 100 a lot of wrinkles and what hair, you know, and kind of ugly, 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 you know, kind of like their mm -hmm. professor. But it's kind of interesting because our current model is that we work till we work maybe till 50 or 60, then we retire. And then, of course, we have another 40, 50 or 60 years of no income. Um, and of course, that causes them all sorts of anxiety because they say, well, how am I going to live? with uh, 40 years of no income, which of course is quite a good question. Um, so again, a really, really important question. What do we want to do with our life? We call that the dream role on the stage of business, on the stage of life. What do I want to do? And then the last thing is, uh, again, something our uh, Western students have a very difficult time with is they, they, I ask them what happens after they die. And it's kind of interesting because they have no clue. Now, for those of you in such an old and ancient civilization with so many spiritual traditions, you might smile at that and say, oh my gosh, you know, uh, we have so much uh, available to us in terms of information and tradition and knowledge. So we have a pretty good feel of what could happen. But unfortunately, uh, my students sometimes aren't really sure at all. So... The way we would think about this model then everyone is think about the role that you want to play. Each role will have a set of skills that you need to master. Those of you that are professors, for example, that's a very, very honorable role, uh, not an easy role to play. However, if you wanted to become an entrepreneur, that again would require a whole different set of skills um, than the ones we would likely have as a professor. So we're there. So we have a feel for what our roles are. And, and when I have my students do this, a lot of times uh, the first step is actually the worst. They oftentimes kind of struggle to try to think a little bit about what they want to do with life, their life. The second thing, if they, uh, if we know what we want, what roles we want to play is then we want to, uh, scan the environment and we want to kind of make sure that we have a pretty good understanding of what's going on. Um, so this has been a part of marketing actually for a really long time. One of the kind of core principles of marketing 
uh, and indeed how this uh, plays out. I think it is quite interesting and also a little bit disturbing actually that the virus has surprised so many people uh, in so many governments and so many industries. If any of you would have talked to a doctor, a doctor would have said, well, of course, we're going to have a pandemic. Uh, a pandemic is an absolute certainty um, because they would know that these kind of things occur uh, and have occurred throughout history. Um, so they would have said that it would be it was something we should expect. And to protect ourselves, we would have to keep scanning our environment so we would know if such a thing is due to impact our uh, country or our industries and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, uh, most of the, for most people and, and most of our governments, uh, the, envir the virus seems to have mm, surprised a lot of people. So the second step in skill mapping is to make sure we're scanning the environment. And we scan the environment, uh, not just for threats, but also for opportunities. So the idea here is that we want to be able to find uh, opportunities that allow us to progress, and that we also want to be able to minimize threats. So this model, has been around for quite a while, actually. Um, it's part of a strategy model, uh, which is called strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And some of you, I think, that have been in business programs have uh, seen them, seen it over the years. So the idea is, is that we need to be able to know uh, any moment in time what our opportunities are, and we drive towards those. And also where our threats are, and we minimize those. Um, so again, uh, so that we're not unpleasantly surprised, um, such as uh, what has occurred here very, very recently. Um, the fourth element uh, the, of the model is the idea of we need to take a look at ourselves. Um, so interestingly enough, um, I have been tasked some to, uh, about once a year, I get the uh, uh, bit, uh, honor of teaching a course on ethics. And so, as many of you know, sometimes business uh, is not quite the way it should be from a standpoint of high ethical values. Um, and indeed, that's some, uh, something that we uh, have to uh, definitely be aware of. Um, and I oftentimes uh, ask them, you know, what are their strengths? And they're quite good at coming up with their strengths. But then sometimes I ask them, what are their weaknesses? And they're not so good at coming up with them at all for some reason or another. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, we oftentimes uh, forget some of the wisdom words that have been in our uh, religious traditions, all of our religious traditions essentially have as a core that we need to know ourselves. And to know ourselves, we have to also look at the idea of some of our traits. Um, in psychology, the, uh, the field thinks that there's somewhere between 32 and 35 traits of personality. And traits of personality are quite interesting, actually. A trait of personality is usually half determined by genetics. Uh, at least that is what uh, the theorists tell us. And so indeed, uh, half of my personality is determined by the genes that I inherited uh, through my family and through my parents. The other half of personality is determined by the environment. And so indeed, the idea here is that we need to take a look at certain types of traits and how well these traits uh, help us. So actually it could be help us or actually it could be in some cases harm us. This is actually, um, I, I, I skipped over a couple of this, but this is actually one of my most favorite of um, bad traits. It's called sloth. Um, for those of you that never heard of this, it's kind of an interesting word. 
Um, what it means, it has two meanings. First of all, there's one meaning call, uh, which has to do with the idea of being lazy. We know that some people are just not very, very enthusiastic about work. So we're gonna call them lazy. And if that is a major trait, that of course will prevent them from being successful. But there's also a second meaning to this one, which is actually more subtle, and actually one that I think is quite fascinating. It goes not living up to your potential. In other words, you have great potential, but you're not using it. It always has been kind of interesting to me because I remember when I first started in the university, there were uh, students that I had lived with in the dorm. And actually, I always considered these students to be much more intelligent than I was, to be brutally honest. Um, but what was interesting about a, a couple of them is they just gave up. Um, they went to the university and they decided it was too hard and they gave up. They gave up, they quit, so on and so forth. And so in my way of thinking today, uh, again, sometimes um, we are blessed with great intelligence. We are blessed with great uh, looks, good looks. Uh, we are, are blessed with many characteristics, but if we don't have motivation, uh, we're still probably not going to succeed. So on this axis of looking at myself, I'm trying to determine my character. And you might say from a leadership standpoint, why should people follow me? Why am I worthy of having a following uh, would be some of the fundamental questions. I, I also need to look at my personality because my personality has elements which will help me, but there are elements of my personality which will maybe keep me or prevent me from succeeding in what I'd like to do. And then last but not least, I need to look at my skills and what skills that I'm going to what enhance. Self-talk, self-talk. Self-talk, oh, yeah. self-talk, okay. Um, thoughts have energy. And so I, I think we all understand that. So my ability to control my thinking is a, a major determination of my success. If I think that I am going to fail, most likely I will fail. If I think that I am going to succeed, most likely I will succeed. So our self-talk is oftentimes what determines uh, our expectations and actually determine what occurs. So um, one element of this is uh, uh, what is referred to as an affirmation. Uh, I'll give you the one that my mother gave to me a long time ago. And to me, this was very, very precious. So my mother said, look, you have to repeat these words over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And so <laughs> <laughs> my mother's very funny. She believed in repetition. Okay. So she said, look, uh, just repeat this over healthy, or you say, I am healthy. Now, all of you in my, I'm looking at everyone here and you all look really young. So you're probably much younger than me. Um, clearly, I am healthy. I am wealthy. I am lucky. I'm lucky. And wise. And wise. Uh, healthy, wealthy, lucky, and wise. And she said, if you keep repeating those things over and over and over, they will tend to happen to you. So uh, I, I think it's a very uh, good question because our thinking is probably one of the most important things we don't control, um, most of us anyway. Um, sir, we have uh, another question from audience, uh, Dr. Sanjay Jain, sir. He is uh, heading the Design of Institute at Sage University Indore. Uh, Sanjay, sir, can I request you to ask a question, please? Uh, thank you so much for spending your time here uh, with us. I have an interesting question, which is, which is what I put to my students as well. I think the, one of the most important skill, uh, which I think the student have to develop every day is their sensorial skills, you know. 
sensorial skills, which also will improve their immune system and yeah. resilience, which you are talking about, and also right. keep them, um, you know, uh, prepared for the change, which we all are talking about, you know, because you have, your body is your instrument. If you have a great immune system, you can take care of any, any change which happens around. You know. So that is a question. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. I, I agree uh, with you 100%. Um, what do you want to say? Um, stress, stress decreases the functioning of the immune system, as we know, right? So in other words, the more stress that I feel, the, the less able my immune system is to throw off diseases. We have a virus where we have no drugs, uh, we have no vaccines. The only thing we have is a healthy immune system. Yes. And therefore, for us to say healthy, we want to lower our stress. We want to control our stress. And in my way, to my way of thinking, that suggests uh, meditation or suggests mindfulness. Um, traditions that have been in India, well, for thousands and thousands of years, um, my meditation being uh, a response in the human body that actually reduces the impact of stress. Some people call it the relaxation response, actually. It opposes the stressors that will suppress our immune system. So I think your observation is is really important. And I don't see enough emphasis on uh, reducing stress yet here. Thank you. Did so I answer your question? I think uh, you did because she um, replied on the chat box. It's very true. So, so I think, yeah, you had it right. Students are the same everywhere. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's the grade. It's the grade. <laughs> so thank you so much uh, for having for being with us today and giving your such uh, in-depth knowledge about this topic uh, and helping out our participants uh, in answering the questions. Because of um, uh, so the, the time, we are not able to ask other questions, but uh, thank you for answering uh, whatever time you had with us. And it's been a privilege to have you with us. I'm sure I'm speaking from everyone's, on everyone's behalf when I say this, that it has been a yeah. Time. Thank you, everyone. Actually, I've been trying to collaborate you since we met in my, in our classroom when you taught us uh, about leading and motivating teams. And yeah. I am really, really grateful that uh, you were so spontaneous about our conversations and we could arrange this talk so soon in a very short period of time. And I thank you and I thank all our participants to be here to uh, ask such nice questions and uh, were so interactive. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk with you. If there's something I can do, please connect with me, please. Okay, please. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sir. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Everyone.